After the French and Indian War, relations between the North American British colonies and the British Parliament grew more and more strained. Parliament sought to demonstrate and enforce its authority over the colonies and to recoup the cost of the war through taxes on their activities. The colonies, particularly New England, felt more and more frustrated by the loss of local control over local affairs. Many colonialists began to see armed conflict as inevitable and started stockpiling arms and ammunition. One important stockpile of weapons had been gathered by the militia in Concord, Massachusetts. This powder keg would soon explode into a war for independence from British rule. And for the colonialists to become Americans, they would need the power of the American gun. The most common guns of the American Revolution were large caliber, smoothbore, and flintlock muskets. In the British Army, the firearm of choice was the British Army land pattern musket, which is known by its nickname, the Brown Bess. Uh, this weapon uh, was largely responsible for winning the English their empire, and uh, this was very easy to make. These things were all entirely handmade within a certain uh, specification. They would make them all roughly to 75 caliber. Uh, the Brown Bess musket, uh, this is an example of the short land pattern, was used uh, just prior to the revolution. But the Brown Bess as a small arms design dates from the early 18th century, around the 1720s. And these were used up till the uh, 1830s roundabout where they switched over to the percussion system and uh, the Enfield rifle musket. Many of these old brown besses uh, had been used during the Napoleonic Wars, although in a slightly updated version. Many of the colonials in the militias and in the Continental Army would use the brown bess. Another common musket among the patriots was the French pattern musket, called the Charleville. The Charleville had been used by the French infantry for years. The 1763 and 1766 models were common in the colonies during the war, purchased by the Congress and secretly imported from France. When the French entered the war, their infantry were also carrying Charlevilles, including the newly designed 1777 model. The Americans also had guns made right in the colonies. Committees of safety were established in the colonies to organize and equip their militias. They ordered guns built by local gunsmiths who frequently followed the design of the Brown Bess. Congress would eventually establish a continental gun factory in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where gunsmith William Henry and his workmen produced arms for the revolution. In addition to muskets and rifles, military officers and some soldiers also carried handguns. Like the long guns, they were all flintlocks. They were deadly at close range, but were inaccurate at any significant distance. These large caliber smooth bore flintlocks could fire a single large lead ball, 
but they could also fire a handful of lead pellets, like a shotgun. George Washington would later encourage his men to load their muskets with a buck and ball. This meant loading the gun with one standard musket ball, probably 69 caliber, and three to six buckshot pellets. This greatly increased the probability of hitting one of the enemy while maintaining the deadly power of the large caliber gun. With the smoothbore muskets used by most of the troops, it was all but impossible to shoot with any real accuracy over any significant distance, making the buck and ball system an attractive option. But that wasn't true for rifles. A rifled barrel has a pattern of twisting grooves, which gives the projectile a spin as it leaves the barrel. That spin gives the bullet stability, allowing an accurate shot over a greater distance. But rifled barrels were more prone to fouling by the black powder used during that period. Also, for a bullet to take advantage of the rifling, it would need to fit tightly into the barrel. This made loading more difficult. Smoothbore guns like the Brown Bess and Charleville could be reloaded more quickly and military tactics at the time did not require the range or accuracy afforded by rifles. But hunters could appreciate both of these characteristics. And by the time of the American Revolution, shooting competitions were held for riflemen to demonstrate their prowess. The American long rifle is sometimes called the Kentucky rifle due to a popular song called The Hunters of Kentucky, which lauded the heroics of frontiersmen during the War of 1812. But rifles were actually made in most of the colonies, and particularly in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and the Carolinas. They were originally designed by German gunsmiths who had immigrated to the colonies. They redesigned the German Jaeger rifle, lengthening the barrel to 44 inches or even longer to improve the gun's accuracy. Rifles were the first truly American-made firearm. Smoothbore muskets like the Brown Bess, Charleville, and the Committee of Safety guns were still more common in New England. Guns such as these, along with powder and ammunition, were stored by the Massachusetts militia at Concord. A provincial congress in Boston had directed Massachusetts towns to establish a rapid response militia, men who could be called upon to grab their guns and go wherever they were needed on a minute's notice. The congress approved the purchase of arms, powder, and ammunition, which were to be stored until needed. In early April 1775, the militia received word that the British knew of the stockpile and were moving to seize it. The militia were able to move most of the supplies out, distributing them among nearby towns. At 2 a.m. on April 19th, about 700 British regulars, including light infantry and grenadiers, marched out of Boston toward Concord. As they marched through Lexington, they had their first encounter with the Massachusetts militia. Captain John Parker and 75 armed militiamen stood at attention. Greatly outnumbered, Captain Parker had told his men not to start a fight. As the British advance party eyed the militiamen, someone's trigger finger itched. No one knows who fired that shot heard round the world, but Captain Parker testified that it wasn't any of his men. In response to that first shot, the British fired a volley into the militia and then charged forward with their bayonets. Bayonets turned the long muskets into spears and pikes to be used in deadly hand-to-hand -hand combat. Bayonets were a military addition to the gun. Expert riflemen in the colonies might have far more skill than British troops as marksmen, 
but they had no experience with the bayonet. A British bayonet charge could be terrifying to the Americans, and for good reason. The accuracy of the smoothbore muskets was so poor that most shots never struck flesh. But the bayonet could stab and cut through that flesh to deadly effect. That day in Lexington, Massachusetts, the British bayonet charge accounted for most of the eight militiamen killed and 10 wounded. Only a single British soldier was wounded. The British troops moved on to Concord, where they found the small amount of supplies that had not been moved and burned them. As they marched back to Boston, however, the British were attacked by Minutemen who had gathered after hearing the shots fired and seeing the smoke in Concord. Shooting from behind fences and trees, the militia harassed the British regulars all the way back to Boston. The colonists were demonstrating those military tactics that they had learned from the natives, a guerrilla style of hit and run, shooting from concealment at a larger but less mobile force. The militia killed 73 British soldiers and wounded 174. The war had begun. The militia encamped around Boston, beginning an 11-month siege. In June, the Continental Congress formed the first Continental Army with George Washington as Commander-in-Chief. This included the formation of 10 companies of expert riflemen to serve as light infantry. Six companies were drawn from Pennsylvania, two from Maryland, and two from Virginia, states where the rifle was most widely used. These riflemen were expected to provide their own arms, powder horn, shot pouch, and other equipment. These were men such as Timothy Murphy of the Pennsylvania frontier. The son of Irish immigrants, Timothy and his brother John, enlisted in Captain John Loudon's company of Northumberland riflemen, where he demonstrated himself an expert marksman able to hit a seven-inch target at 250 yards. Murphy's skills qualified him to be placed into Daniel Morgan's elite rifle corps. When it comes to the ability to, uh, to, to use firearms in battle, uh, when you're looking at the uh, Continental Army versus the British Army, one of the popular myths is that we were armed with, uh, with rifles. That that were capable of inflicting fatal casualties out to uh, 300 yards or better, while the British were armed with smoothbore muskets of 75 caliber. That's three quarters of an inch in diameter of lead flying through the air. A uh, British major once wrote in his diary, woe be it to the unlucky, unfortunate fellow struck and done harm by a ball fired at a distance of greater than 75 yards. Uh, that was true for the smoothbores. The rifles could reach three times that distance. The problem was that not everybody was armed with rifles, as the popular myth uh, is so prevalent. Uh, certainly, the Minutemen at uh, Concord and Lexington did fire at the British. They harassed that column uh, from dawn until dusk by firing at them from behind trees and rocks and bridges. And they were very excellent marksmen. They had used their guns. They were economical in shooting because these were the tools that fed their family. These weren't rich individuals. These were individuals that were eking out a living on the frontier, out in the country. Every shot counted back then. Uh, a wounded deer from a misplaced shot would result in hours of tracking and the expenditure of more powder and lead, of which was in short supply. Daniel Morgan was a veteran of the French and Indian War. During the Revolutionary War, he commanded a crack troop of marksmen, backwoods men who had grown up hunting, tracking, and scouting. Officially named the Rangers, they were better known as Morgan's Riflemen. 
At the Second Battle of Saratoga, October 7th, 1777, Morgan's riflemen were there. Morgan commanded the left flank of the American forces. During the battle, the British line fell into disarray, but British General Simon Fraser was rallying them to reform. American General Benedict Arnold, who had not yet turned traitor, saw General Fraser and shouted to Morgan, that man on the gray horse is a host unto himself and must be disposed of. Direct the attention of some of the sharpshooters amongst your riflemen to him. Morgan did as he was commanded, and soon Tim Murphy was climbing a tree that would give him a clear line of sight to the target 300 yards away. He fired a single shot, and General Fraser fell. Without Fraser to rally them, the British line fell apart. The Americans won at Saratoga and in the process secured France as a formal ally in the war. But though the rifle had proven itself a formidable weapon, it had serious drawbacks in combat. So the idea that we all had rifles uh, is somewhat of a, of a myth. The Continental Army was equipped with uh, muskets that were very similar to the British muskets. And when the two armies met, they generally met closing at a distance of, of less than 100 yards, firing smoothbore muskets at each other. But the riflemen, the American side, did have a greater number of individual riflemen. The problem was is that they were going up against the best trained army in the world at that time. These British redcoats had tremendous military discipline. They had been professional soldiers. They weren't volunteers, they weren't new recruits. The American army was basically inexperienced. There were a few that had experienced the French and Indian Wars and some of the colonial wars with the Native Americans in the area, but very few of them had the type of training the type of discipline that the British soldier had. When it came to actually fighting on the field, we were at a distinct disadvantage. When the British, however, actually saw the, effects, the effectiveness of rifled musketry on their ranks uh, from, the, from the Continental Army and the units that were using rifles, they adopted a regiment of riflemen themselves, but they never put them to their tactical advantage. The smoothbore muskets like the Brown Bests were the standard infantry weapons for a good reason. They could be loaded and fired much more rapidly than a rifle. For a bullet to benefit from the gun barrel's rifling, it must fit snugly into the barrel. It could take a full minute to load a rifle. First, the powder is poured from the powder horn into the powder measure to ensure the proper amount of powder. Or, riflemen might choose just to eyeball it. The powder is then poured down the barrel of the rifle. Then the rifleman prepares the patch, a moistened or greased bit of material. The lead ball is rammed down the barrel carefully on top of the patch using a ramrod. Finally, he cocks the hammer and adds powder to the priming pan. Now he's ready to shoot, the whole process having taken about a minute. In contrast, a smoothbore musket could use a prepared paper cartridge containing the powder and the ball. The soldier would bite open a cartridge, pour a little powder into the priming pan, close the pan, and pour the rest of the powder down the muzzle. The powder was followed by the rest of the cartridge, paper and lead ball, the paper serving as the wadding. Then he would ram the ball in and was ready to fire. Trained soldiers could load and fire a smoothbore musket four times per minute. Also, the rifle, like all civilian long guns, was not designed to accommodate a bayonet. 
Not long after their success at Saratoga, Morgan's riflemen encountered some British light infantry under Colonel Robert Abercrombie. The riflemen moved to attack, and Abercrombie ordered a bayonet charge. Only a quarter of the riflemen had time to fire a single shot before being scattered and driven back. But the British feared the riflemen nonetheless, specifically the British officers who were being killed. The European style of fighting, with massed soldiers firing volleys while standing in the open, was completely at odds with the small bands of hunters who picked off British officers without warning. Many among the British Army considered this cowardly, or even a war crime. Nonetheless, they recognized the value of riflemen as skirmishers, though they did not have as many in the field. A thousand British rifles, the pattern 1776 infantry rifles, were distributed to the light companies of each regiment. British Major Patrick Ferguson also developed a breech-loading rifle. About a hundred of these were issued to Rifle Corps in 1777. Of course, most American soldiers were also using smoothbore muskets. During the American Revolution, most American soldiers carried a Brown Bess, Charleville, or a Committee of Safety musket, which were patterned on the Brown Bess. After the war, the American Army needed its own standard issue musket. In 1776, an arsenal was established in Springfield, Massachusetts. In 1794, it became the first national armory, and in 1795, it produced the first truly American musket. During the war, thousands of 1766 Charlevilles had been delivered to the colonies by their French allies, and the gun was well regarded by American soldiers. It served as the inspiration for the 1795 U.S. Army musket, which would be used during the War of 1812. The model 1795 uh, is considered the first American-made shoulder arm for the U.S. Army. Uh, this particular example is uh, a copy of the 1795 made in Springfield, Massachusetts. But along with the arsenal in Massachusetts, uh, there was an arsenal in Harpers Ferry, uh, Virginia, that produced a copy of the 1795. Uh, this musket is um, almost an exact copy of the model 1777 Charleville musket given to us by the French government uh, to support our revolution. Uh, it works uh, like any flint lock. It uses a simple piece of flint in the lock mechanism uh, that strikes against this steel face, a frizzen, or uh, a hammer, as they called it during the 18th century. Uh, this is actually the cock, and this is the hammer. Uh, when you cock it, full cock, and press the trigger, a shower of sparks goes into the pan, igniting uh, about a teaspoon's worth of gunpowder in the pan. Uh, that, in turn, goes into a tiny hole in the base of the barrel, called a touch hole, igniting the main charge and firing the weapon. A good soldier was supposed to be able to fire three shots a minute. The model 1795 musket is the musket that we fought the War of 1812 with. Uh, this musket was replaced by a, uh, a uh, model of 1816, which had only a couple improvements, namely the pan, rather than iron, it was made of brass and less susceptible to uh, powder fouling and corrosion. In 1799, construction began on the second National Armory at Harper's Ferry in the western part of Virginia that would eventually split off to become West Virginia. By 1810, over 10,000 muskets, 
rifles, and pistols were produced each year. A notable model musket produced at both the Harpers Ferry and Springfield Armories was the Model 1816 Flintlock Musket. The Model 1816 was an improvement on the Model 1812, which had borrowed its design from the French Charleville 1777. The 69 caliber barrel was 42 inches long, like the 1812, but the Model 1816 had a longer lock plate, a shorter trigger guard, and a longer bayonet. In total, the musket was 58 inches long. Further improvements were made in 1822, 1835, 1840, and 1842. Almost 700,000 model 1816 muskets were manufactured at Harpers Ferry and Springfield between 1816 and 1844, more than any other U.S. flintlock musket. These were the muskets used to defend the Alamo in San Antonio, Texas in 1836 and by the U.S. Army in the Mexican-American War. A major innovation occurred in 1839 that would solve one of the greatest problems plaguing flintlock guns, which was they didn't work well in wet weather. If the powder became wet while it was added to the priming pan, the primer charge wouldn't ignite, and therefore, neither would the gunpowder that would fire the bullet. Patented in 1822, the percussion cap was a small copper cap containing mercury of fulminate. The cap could be attached to a nipple and tube leading into the barrel of the gun. When the trigger was pulled, the gun's hammer would strike the cap, sending a flame through the nipple and tube into the barrel igniting the gunpowder and firing the bullet. After the development of the percussion cap, many flintlock muskets were converted to the percussion system. This was a relatively simple conversion, as most hardware for the percussion system is exactly the same as the flintlock. The first standard U.S. rifle to use the percussion system was the M1841 Mississippi Rifle. Uh, this is a uh, model 1841 U.S. rifle, uh, nicknamed the Mississippi, uh, not because it was made in Mississippi, but because a regiment of Mississippi volunteers commanded by a man named Jefferson Davis, who was later to become the president of the Confederate States of America, uh, commanded a regiment of Mississippi volunteers armed with the model 1841 rifle in the Battle of Buena Vista during the Mexican-American War. Uh, the Battle of Buena Vista was fought in February of 1847, and uh, the Mississippi Volunteers were instrumental in winning that battle for the Americans. They checked a, uh, uh, an assault by Mexican forces. This weapon is 54 caliber, and it's extremely unique because it is the very first shoulder arm in the U.S. arsenal with a percussion system. Uh, the percussion system is really quite simple. It has a cone or a nipple as it's called and a small uh, percussion cap would be fitted to that. The cap was full of uh, uh, fulminating mixture called uh, mercury fulminate. Uh, when you cock back the hammer and depress the trigger, uh, the hammer strikes the cap sending a hot jet of flame through this bolster into a hole in the barrel igniting the main charge. Uh, it's really loaded very much like any muzzle loader. The main cartridge would be uh, poured down the muzzle here and rammed home with the ramrod. Uh, because this weapon has a great deal of brass furniture, uh, it was considered very attractive weapon for its time. It's got the brass muzzle strap up here, uh, brass band, brass trigger guard, patch box, and butt plate. First regulation smoothbore musket with a percussion lock was the 1842 Springfield musket. Produced at both Springfield and Harper's Ferry, the 1842 model was a further development of the 1816 model. 
The original smoothbore 1842 model and a modified rifled version were used extensively in the Civil War. The next major development in firearms was not the gun, but the bullet. The mini ball was developed by French Army officer Claude Etienne Minier. The mini ball was a muzzle loading, spin stabilizing bullet for rifled barrels. With a cone like shape similar to the modern idea of a bullet, it was made of soft lead and had a hollowed base. Rather than the traditional bullet for a rifle, which had to fit tightly into the barrel, the mini ball was slightly smaller than the hollow of the rifle's barrel. When the gun was fired, the hollow base of the ball would expand, catching the grooves of the rifled barrel and taking full advantage of the increased speed and accuracy that the spin provided. Because the mini ball was slightly smaller, it was much easier to ram home than traditional bullets in a rifle. The mini ball would first be used extensively in Europe in the Crimean War. It would prove deadly there and again in the American Civil War. While these developments were being made in muskets, rifles, and bullets, major innovations were taking place with handguns as well. And the greatest innovator of American handguns was Samuel Colt. As the slogan said, God created man, Sam Colt made them equal. Colt's first patent was the uh, 1836 Patterson revolver. It was a, an innovation in firearms design and technology. Now that's not to say it was the first firearm that had a revolving cylinder on it or the idea of a revolving cylinder. There had been many before, the Collier, uh, the list of names that you don't recognize goes on and on, uh, only to be found in the dusty records of the patent office. The reason why Colt is today a household word is because Colt's design was the first practical revolver. It was the first one that actually worked. Now Colt uh, produced a number of different models of, of this gun uh, at Patterson, New Jersey, the uh, plant that he, uh, he, he worked from over Patterson Falls. Uh, and his guns uh, came in three different frame sizes from 28 caliber up to uh, 36 caliber. Uh, most of them uh, were five shot, not the common or more traditional six shot that we know of today. Uh, Colt took them down to Florida. Uh, there they were used during the Seminole War of 1838. Uh, a number of individuals uh, that fought with the U.S. Army in Florida were exposed not only to Colonel Colt himself, uh, but to his, his new firearm invention. Uh, guys like Samuel Hamilton Walker of, uh, of Maryland uh, took Patterson revolvers with him when he left Florida and went west and became a Texas Ranger with Jack Coffee Hayes and uh, the list of, of great you know, Texas Rangers from the 1840s when Texas was a republic. But unfortunately it never found favor with the U.S. military at the time because ordnance officers were afraid that if a soldier uh, had the ability to discharge his weapon rapidly, he would do so indiscriminately. And of course there's the cost involved. Uh, generally an individual can fire a muzzle loading gun three times a minute. Uh, each one of those shots costs the ordnance department so many, uh, so many pennies per shot. If you're able to uh, triple or quintuple that rate of fire, that drives the cost up as well. Uh, so the idea was limit the number of rounds you have, you limit the expense, and the individual firing will be much more economical on many levels in the discharging of his firearm. Not all rifles were made at the U.S. armories, of course. One popular model was the Sharps rifles, produced by the Sharps Rifle Manufacturing Company. The Sharps rifles played a role in Bleeding Kansas, the violent struggle between pro and anti-slavery forces that preceded the Civil War. Breech-loading Sharps 
were supplied to anti-slavery activists. They were called Beecher's Bibles because activist Henry Ward Beecher insisted that while you might just as well read the Bible to buffaloes as to those fellows. They have a supreme respect for the logic that is embodied in Sharp's rifle. One of the most violent actors in bleeding Kansas would soon make a strike against the second National Armory at Harper's Ferry. John Brown had killed men with a broadsword in Kansas, but at Harper's Ferry, in October 1859, he would lead what he hoped would be the start of a massive slave rebellion armed by the arsenal at Harper's Ferry. John Brown's friend, abolitionist Frederick Douglass, warned that Brown would find himself in a steel trap of death. Colonel Robert E. Lee led a force of Marines to stop insurrection. Douglas' prediction was correct. He later described Brown's assault on Harper's Ferry. On the night of the 16th of October, 1859, there appeared a party of 19 men, 14 white and five black. They were not only armed themselves, but had brought with them a large supply of arms for such persons as might join them. Three out of the 19 invaders were captured whilst fighting, and one of these was Captain John Brown. John Brown died by hanging on December 2nd, 1859. Half his men were killed during the raid, including one of Brown's sons. Most of the others were captured and hanged. Four men escaped, including another of Brown's sons. This was one more event to shock the consciences of the American people and to put them into opposing camps on the rightness of Brown's cause, if not his method. Less than 18 months after the raid on Harper's Ferry, the American Civil War began with the firing on Fort Sumter. This war would see the advancements in firearm technology take a shocking toll. As brother fought brother, the American gun would prove itself deadlier than ever. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.